We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everyone, my name is Michael Ogia. I'm the Director of External Relations at the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, as well as a steering committee member of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. It's an honor to be here and also incredibly encouraging to witness the IGF community recognize the importance of this topic, especially given that this main session immediately follows the IGF Policy Network for Environment and Digital, P&E for short, presenting their draft report. The urgency surrounding uh, it has never been greater. Uh, internet dependent technologies are an integral part of our daily lives, even more so considering the pandemic. Even though we still need more work and more evidence, the digital world has a strong influence on the environment and vice versa. I just very briefly want to show a slide, just a second, just to illustrate this point more clearly. So as you can see on this, uh, can you please bring up uh, the, I just shared my screen, can you, thank you. So as you can see, major ICT sustainability issues include, but are certainly not limited to, multiple things, including energy consumption and climate impact. There's things like the resiliency of infrastructure, given things like rising sea levels, um, the extensiveness, the extensive and complex supply chains that exist, the resource use, water, land, etc., cetera, um, and then obviously the impact on biodiversity and communities. So these, again, these are just some of the ways that the environment and digital intersect. Having said that, at the same time, Digital technologies can be of paramount importance in effectively tackling environmental issues. Therefore, despite the need to make ICTs sustainable themselves, the impact that they have on our efforts to solve environmental crises cannot be understated. For instance, collecting and analyzing data can help predict the weather or, most, uh, or the most advantageous crop time, while satellites are helping to map deforestation around the world as we speak. Using open access data, small and de decentralized projects can bring attention to localized environmental issues, such as biodiversity and weather, that might otherwise be overlooked, but might help, say, a local farmer develop their capacity and resilience to develop their farm and their livelihood. Despite these positive benefits, however, it is important to recognize nuance, specifically that environmental data shouldn't just be seen as a panacea. Generating more for the sake of generating more will exacerbate other problems, such as further contributing to the amount of data stored on a server and the need to produce greater numbers of ICTs, which can ultimately lead to greater number, a greater amount of, of electronic waste, e-waste for short. Within this scope, the session will discuss the meaning of environmental data, how it could take advantage of data governance, and the role to disseminate the negative impact on the environment that, uh, that environmental data has in order to mitigate that. As data also has an impact on multiple sectors and stakeholder groups, including policymakers, we also discuss how data can contribute to better and more informed policy decisions. Collection of data needs good governance. Therefore, policymakers need to increase their capacities in grasping the use of data in their decisions. A very quick housekeeping note for all of my colleagues here in the audience is that please do follow the chat in the Zoom room as well, as I'm sure it will be lively. Now, with that said, I would like to go ahead and move to the first sequence. And with that, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Florino Wospi, who will uh, discuss a little bit, just, in, uh, just rediscuss for anybody who didn't uh, attend before the PE and how this, section, this session connects to it. Florina, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Michael. I'm just connecting to the Zoom room at the same time just to make sure that I can share um, something with you as well in the chat because just before, as Michael has said, we had the p &E sessions or the, net, the session on the policy network on environment where we've been working on uh, with a wider community of interested um, people on a, on a report that is um, about different topics of relevance to this nexus of environment and digitalization. So we've had different chapters and feel free to also check out our website if you're interested in that report. It will be published soon. If you are also interested in closer like collaborating with us or reviewing the document, you can also directly reach out to me. I will share my contact. But basically, with regard to this session here, so obviously we're focusing today on environmental data. So just to say that um, for environmental data, we've had a whole chapter on that and our recommendations circle around. So we had like three major policy recommendations that we formulated. And one is that there is a need to focus more on the fostering of global standardization and the harmonization of environmental data. Then we've also postulated that there we need to ensure that there is in that kind of the, the access to environmental data goes from the co collection to the sense making so that the, we really consider the whole data life cycle and make sure that we have access on, um, we generate access to all interested stakeholders on all parts of the life cycle. And thirdly, we are kind of um, striving towards or we're uh, really making a plaidoyer to increase the cooperation to maximize the impact of digitizing environmental information. So these are three um, recommendations that we've been discussing or we are discussing in our report and we will be really happy if you also take a look at that if you're further interested. Other chapters include we have a chapter on food and water security and we have one on the supply chain transparency and circularity which are all very important topics I, I'm sure but today we're here to discuss or dive deeper into the topic of environmental data, which is certainly also very interesting and has a lot to, to talk. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, I think, and we encourage your participation, as I'm sure Michael will also repeat probably several times. But I think especially in these um, kind of empty rooms with a lot of people on Zoom, it can feel quite nice if for us here in the, um, on the panel there is also some active participation um, from the people sitting in front of us. So thank you. Wonderful, Florina, thank you so much. And with that said, let's go ahead and start, let's open a bit of the interactive bit of this. And for my colleagues in the back, the tech team, I will be sharing a Mintimeter at the moment, which hopefully should come up here on this screen. Assuming it comes up, there we go. So just very quickly for anybody that's, uh, for all the, the people joining online as well as people here in the audience, we're just gonna have, go through a few quick questions just to help uh, establish a bit of the framework for this, or you know, some grounds for this. Um, I'm gonna give just, just like a few seconds just for everybody to get online, to sign into the session. Can just because I can't see the peop I can't see the Zoom room necessarily. Um, can everybody, at least in the room, let me know whenever you guys are online? Whenever everyone's online? Just like a, see okay. It, yes. Oh, great. Okay, let's get started then. So, I hope this will work correctly. Please, cor please forgive me if it does not. So the first thing is, which country are you joining from? just to have an idea of where everybody is, uh, where everybody is in the world. Ooh, yay, it's working. <laughs> Fantastic, we have many people coming from Poland, obviously, Singapore, Belgium, oh, thank you so much. Whoever's in Singapore, thank you for being up very late. Bienvenido to our colleagues in Argentina, in Colombia. Estonia, Canada, uh, likewise, thank you all for uh, Canadians and everyone in South America for getting up so early, assuming it is early for you. In Finland, wow. Oh, and bom dia to all of our colleagues in Brazil. 
Wonderful. So we are spread out all over the world. So this is wonderful. I really appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and go to the second question. So of course, which stakeholder group do you represent? I think the answers might give us a good indication of where we should apply our efforts in the coming, uh, coming year to perhaps reach out to new audiences. But it is good to see that we have a pretty broad mix of, of people joining from across the sector. Excellent. Well, good to see, and obviously, good to see so much participation from across the sectors. Obviously, civil society is represented very well. Of course, we will always try strive to increase the amount of people that are interested in this work and uh, from their sectors. So, on to the next question. Assuming that it, there we go. Ugh. Of course, doesn't work when you need it to. <laughs> ah, here we go. So, of the PE's reports or the PE reports chapters, which section is the most relevant to you? Which one do you does uh, resonates the most with the work that you're doing? Well, very convenient that it seems everyone is interested in environmental data. You are in the right session. Mm. And the opportunities and risks, frankly, go hand in hand with the environmental data. So this is wonderful. Good. I'm, I certainly hope we won't disappoint. Well, thank you. Let's move to the next question for the sake of time. So this is another one that I'm really curious about. What does the term environmental data mean to you? And this is uh, one that you, know, you can submit as much as you want, um, and it, all of your responses should be coming up uh, um, kind of as a, almost like as a wall. So data related to the environment, care, fair, excellent. Data on waste, we will cover that. CO2 emissions, of course, opportunity, intersectional, I love that one. There's so much opportunity for intersectional um, contributions here, so I'm, uh, I'm really, really glad that somebody mentions that. Planetary information, wonderful. You are certainly in the right session then. I don't know what JSEC is, so if anybody who wrote that would be willing to enlighten us in the chat, that would be really good. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Apparently that's a Polish name, didn't know. Today I learned. Fantastic, this is great. I'm really, uh, I'm really glad that obviously this topic resonates with everyone, let's go to the next question. There's just a few more. So this is a good, how do you employ environmental, now that we have some idea of what environmental data is, how do you employ environmental data in your day-to-day -day life, such as with the weather or air pollution, farming related information, policy creation, etc.? Again, an open-ended question.
I also check weather and air pollution. Completely understand. Drafting a framework to draft policy recommendations, absolutely. Policy creation, weather, <laughs> good. It seems like then most people are integrating environmental data to their day-to-day -day lives, which as you can imagine, is incredible. as you can see, is clearly important. I too like pierogi, but uh, I don't think pierogi has anything to do with environmental data, at least not that I know of. Status of the environment, things like deforestation, etc. well done. Good to see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's just for the interest of time, let's go to the next question. So this is a good one, especially, uh, this is one for everyone that's, that's here. How could access to environmental data help you and your community more? Again, an open-ended question. We're really curious to know, how do you think more of it would help you or potentially less? Policy advocacy, excellent choice, excellent uh, input rather. Accountability, absolutely. Better choices in general. I agree with that one, all I would say for consumers and for, um, for production. Awareness, education, demanding change, more fair. I don't know if fair is a, an acronym. Feel free to um, write it in the chat. Climate change impact at the local level, absolutely. That's a very, very good one. Understanding how climate change is actually impacting communities. Good morning to you too. Accountability again, change, I love this. This is, this is very much, this is wonderful. If anybody's trying to speak, just, uh, just please do mute yourselves. If, um, and we will get the questions soon enough. Uh, what the fuck? Excuse me. <laughs> I think the Zoom room just got Zoom bombed. Okay, uh, apologies to anyone uh, if anyone just saw something that was um, disturbing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, can the technical team, we seem to be getting Zoom bombed. Can, is, can please someone take care of that? Anybody's not familiar with Zoom bombing, it's a very awful and disruptive tactic that's happened to me personally in the past. Um, it's happening at the moment on Zoom. I apologize to everyone that's attending. Um, so sorry about this. It's um, very awful. Mm. We're going to pause at the moment just to um, to sort that out, and as soon as it's as soon as we can move on, I will let you know. And the responses are still coming in, so thank you for everyone to be so undisturbed by yes. interruptions. Can we, can we just turn it off? Okay. Yeah. 
very sorry, everyone, about that. Um, for any, yeah, anybody in the room, don't. Uh, in physically, there was just a attack online, but we are going to uh, readapt. So. Um, Sorry, I was not expecting that. Well, in the interest of time, there was, I just want uh, to note to everybody that's attending, both in person and uh, in the Zoom room, that on the 2nd of November, the, the multi-stakeholder advisory group, the MAG, if anybody's not familiar, which is the IGF's Steering and Program Committee, they convened a 90-minute introductory and preparatory session to help frame the challenges faced by this year's focus areas, such as the environment, environmental sustainability and climate change. The key takeaways from those discussions based on the feedback received were divided into three parts. The negative impacts of digital technology for the environment, what technologies can do for the environment, and of course, what next, the future impact uh, and policy recommendations. I just wanna highlight a few of those in just in the interest of time. For instance, for part one, uh, high on the list of challenges was uh, the impact of e-waste, along with the energy and resource consumption of data centers. Uh, both of those issues specifically requires multi-stakeholder solutions to address effectively, and given the scale and complexity of the digital sector, combined with the gravity of the problem, means that we need to act quickly and collaboratively. In terms of what technology can do for the environment, the participants highlighted three critical areas. The first was capacity building, especially within the Global South, to help minimize climate change impacts and accelerate mitigation and adaptation. Second, it's important that environmental data is collected and then shared openly across communities, and particularly impactful when modern technology is coupled with indigenous knowledge and methodologies. Lastly, while global responses are necessary, it's important that those who are most impacted by the depletion of resources, pollution, and the destruction of ecosystems be considered and included. And then part three of the introductory session, it focused on the future impact and suggestions for policymakers. It was made clear that the struggle for environmental justice is multidimensional, multidisciplinary, and strongly connected to social justice. It is vital to take local experiences and knowledge, particularly from the Global South, into account since it will only be possible to realize the SDGs and the UN 23 agenda, as well as foster environmental sustainability by bringing the diverse local experiences and knowledge to the forefront. There are also many opportunities for collaboration across the IGF ecosystem, including with other policy networks, such as the one on meaning, meaningful access, and the work of the dynamic coalitions, such as the, the DC on community connectivity. The IGF can contribute to building the understanding of the co-shared responsibility of the diverse sta stakeholders to mitigate the crisis, monitor and assess the environmental impact of digital digitization, foster transparency and accountability, as everyone uh, pointed out, and shape policy responses. <clears throat> Other recommendations included a serious focus uh, on environmental impact assessments, um, fostering new digital literacy initiatives uh, related to environmental data, uh, minimizing the duplication of our efforts given limited time and resources, and of, uh, and of course, committing to building sustainable digital infrastructure. Um, Last, very lastly, it was recommended that the IGF embrace human rights and environmental justice, both at the local and global level, since there are multiple intersections between these two movements and technological governance. So with that, and all of the disruptions hopefully now aside, we're gonna move to the first set of speakers uh, who have, uh, we have who are going to elaborate on what di environmental data is and why it's important as well as highlight key issues related to environmental data governance. Joining us today are Julian Casabuenas, the Ed Executive Director at Colnado, Lily Edenam Mbotsioe, the IT Community Engagement Lead at HackLab Foundation, and Dave Reeski, Visiting Scholar at the Environmental Law Institute. I hope I did not uh, do, you know, uh, butcher your names. Um, Julian, we're gonna start with you, over to you. Ah, you're muted.
we still cannot hear you. Let him know. Julian, we still cannot hear you on, on uh, Lo Siento. You but cannot hear me on now side. Now we can hear you. Murphy's Law, if everything can go wrong, it will. So thank you so much. Please go ahead with your intervention. Okay, as um, uh, I was saying, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish, taking uh, advantage of the translation system. Um, muchas gracias por uh, la invitación a eh, esta sesión principal eh, sobre eh, temas eh, del medio ambiente, sostenibilidad y cambio climático. Eh, mi presentación está orientada un poco hacia la experiencia desde organizaciones de sociedad civil eh, como Colnodo, desde donde su um, eh, inicio en la eh, hacia los uh, 1994, eh, iniciamos con un eje transversal de desarrollo sostenible, trabajando mucho de la mano con el programa de Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente en la implementación y uso de herramientas de Internet para la implementación de la Red de Desarrollo Sostenible, una iniciativa de Naciones Unidas en su momento que se extendió eh, por todo el mundo y que buscaba eh, utilizar eh, las nuevas tecnologías para facilitar el acceso a la información. Y mi presentación está orientada hacia esa experiencia y un poco contarles cuál puede ser aquellos aspectos que consideramos son eh, claves desde la perspectiva de organizaciones de sociedad civil eh, y personas que estamos interesados en la sostenibilidad ambiental. Eh, hacia el año 1993 se creó en Colombia el Ministerio del Medio Ambiente y el Sistema Nacional Ambiental, eh, con el objeto de brindar el apoyo científico, tecnológico que se requiere para la formulación de políticas ambientales. Esto obligó a entes ambientales a implementar sistemas de información en el área de sus jurisdicciones. Internet llegó a Colombia en el año 96 y allí vimos nuevas oportunidades para crear sistemas de información en línea que permitieran un mejor acceso a la información ambiental a todos los interesados. Así, con el liderazgo del Ministerio de Ambiente y las corporaciones ambientales regionales y algunos municipios, hacia el 2001 eh, tuvimos la oportunidad desde Colnodo de participar en la creación del sistema básico de información ambiental basado en herramientas de Internet como un complemento para las entidades ambientales regionales pudieran gestionar su información ambiental. Dado que el Ministerio de Ambiente en su momento eh, operaba el Sistema Nacional Ambiental, se proponía un sistema extremadamente amplio que no le permitía a las organizaciones territoriales, especialmente a los pequeños municipios, mantener en ese Sistema Nacional Ambiental su información ambiental. De tal manera que se creó un sistema con una herramienta básica para el apoyo de los procesos de toma de decisiones municipales relacionadas con la gestión de desarrollo territorial, integrando solamente un conjunto clave de indicadores, eh, que los llamamos indicadores básicos, un componente de geoinformación esencial que comenzaban a generarse eh, las oportunidades de presentación en línea eh, de estos sistemas y un mecanismo de interacción con los usuarios y la comunidad en general denominado Observatorio de Desarrollo Sostenible. A través de estos sistemas se buscaba permitir la consulta, el acceso a la información básica, tanto en los niveles territoriales como regionales y nacionales, generar espacios de interacción entre la comunidad y las instituciones a través de un flujo permanente de información cualificada e indicadores que permitieran evaluar el desempeño de las mismas, las condiciones ambientales locales y el cumplimiento de las metas de los diferentes instrumentos de planeación. 
Este sistema se desarrolló en software libre y código abierto, lo que permitió su utilización por parte de muchas de las organizaciones ambientales interesadas y de los municipios para la gestión de sus indicadores ambientales. Un aspecto muy importante fue la creación de un set de indicadores básicos que fueran viables y que pudieran mantenerse en el tiempo, de tal manera que se concertó la creación con las autoridades ambientales, los municipios, para que pudieran ser mantenidos, ya que en otras oportunidades se habían definido indicadores muy pertinentes, pero que no era posible obtener información base para su construcción y mantenimiento. Eh, fueron seleccionados aquellos indicadores básicos que de alguna manera pudieran posteriormente utilizarse más adelante para la creación de los índices ambientales. Creo que esto está muy relacionado con eh, el reporte de la Red de Política sobre Medio Ambiente en el tema de fomentar la estandarización y armonización global de los datos. Tenemos que tener un sistema de indicadores base, pero que sean realmente eh, eh, implementables y se puedan mantener en el tiempo. Con esto, por primera vez en el país tuvimos la oportunidad de acceder a la información ambiental a través de las entidades ambientales y municipios. En 2009, la Secretaría de Ambiente de Bogotá decidió organizar el sistema de información ambiental a través de la implementación de un observatorio ambiental para la ciudad. El desarrollo se dio gracias a la visión del alcalde de una estrategia de planeación ambiental con visión regional para la adaptación y mitigación del cambio climático en Bogotá. Y aquí comenzamos ya a hablar de los compromisos que tenemos como ciudad y como país en lo relacionado al cambio climático. Y esto se da motivado a una deficiente articulación de la información, al conocimiento parcial de la dinámica de los ecosistemas y al aprovechamiento de los recursos naturales y de tecnologías sostenibles, así como el poco uso que se le daba a los resultados de las investigaciones básicas y aplicadas en la ciudad. A partir del de software que comenté al comienzo, el Sistema de Información Básico Municipal, fue posible un desarrollo sobre esta plataforma eh, eh, para el Observatorio Ambiental de Bogotá en el 2011. Y posteriormente, en el 2015, en esa misma línea de ir evolucionando sobre herramientas de software libre en este, momen, eh, en, en este caso, se creó el Observatorio del Río Bogotá. En general, todo este registro, almacenamiento, validación, monitoreo, control, evaluación, divulgación, articulación y acceso a la información ambiental en sus diferentes componentes resulta ser una tarea indispensable y de obligatorio cumplimiento para velar por el saneamiento de los ecosistemas y para propiciar la implantación de las buenas prácticas de la gestión ambiental. Los observatorios se convierten entonces en esos instrumentos de gestión ambiental y al involucrar a la comunidad es posible generar banco de datos e información que es de trascendencia ambiental es posible promover una participación institucional entre los diferentes niveles de las ramas ejecutivas, invitar a participar de manera permanente y activa al sector privado en temas ambientales y a todos los sectores interesados. Permite eh, la implementación de las herramientas de medición, control, seguimiento y evaluación que permiten identificar de manera oportuna las medidas de intervención necesarias para la problemática y promover la adopción de las buenas prácticas de gestión ambiental. Igualmente, divulgar los análisis y evaluación para permitir la adopción de mejores decisiones de carácter ambiental con la participación de la comunidad. Y finalmente, divulgar y promover una cultura ambiental bajo la realización de programas, campañas educativos para la comunidad en general. Actualmente, solo como referencia, el Observatorio Ambiental de Bogotá cuenta con más de 450 indicadores clasificados por recursos naturales y, y temas de gestión ambiental como cambio climático, control para la calidad ambiental, ecosistemas, educación ambiental y participación, gestión ambiental empresarial, movilidad sostenible, ordenamiento y ecoturismo y planes de gestión ambiental. Y también todos estos indicadores han sido fundamentales para el seguimiento de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de las Naciones Unidas. 
Eh, y eh, los observatorios también fueron concebidos como un espacio de interacción con la comunidad, en donde la comunidad puede compartir eventos, noticias, canta, campañas, tips ambientales, boletines y participar en foros de, 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 de discusión sobre los temas que son de interés para la ciudad. Una prueba de este enfoque que es relevante es mencionar que este observatorio ganó el premio en 2015 del Ministerio de Tecnologías de Información y Comunicación sobre Excelencia de Gobierno, de gobierno en Línea y Datos Abiertos. Pero, ¿por qué es importante eh, esta información? Eh, un ejemplo que quisiera mencionar es el relacionado con... Eh, el reporte para el GISWATCH, que es el reporte global de la Sociedad de la Información, eh, en donde eh, el año 2020 trató sobre tecnología, ambiente y un mundo sostenible, respuestas del sur global. En el reporte de Colombia nos centramos en determinar cómo el aumento del consumo de Internet suponía un incremento importante en el consumo de energía eléctrica, dada la implementación del trabajo remoto, la educación en línea y las múltiples actividades que se trasladaron al entorno virtual y su impacto sobre el medio ambiente. Paralelamente, evaluamos los beneficios en el ambiente por la reducción en el uso de vehículos a gasolina en la ciudad, dado que las personas dejaron de desplazarse a sus sitios de trabajo. Encontramos un incremento en el consumo energético por uso de Internet del 52% con respecto a la, a, 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 al año anterior del 2019, lo que representó unas emisiones adicionales de unas 20.000 toneladas de CO2 por mes. Pero paralelamente, la reducción en el consumo de gasolina para el mismo periodo fue del 65%, lo que representó una reducción de emisiones de más de 574.000 toneladas. Es decir, que el beneficio por la reducción en el uso de vehículos en la ciudad fue muy superior al impacto del aumento de consumo de energía por el uso de Internet. Y al validar esta información en el observatorio ambiental con los indicadores, por ejemplo, de material particulado, vemos que para ese periodo hubo una reducción del 20% en ese indicador con respecto al mismo mes del año anterior y se lograron llegar a los niveles más bajos reportados desde el 2006 en eh, temas de eh, micras por metro cúbico eh, eh, y la calidad del ambiente claramente mejoró. Si eh, hablamos claro de la ventaja de haber reducido las emisiones por ahorro en combustibles fósiles, somos conscientes también del impacto que tienen los residuos electrónicos en el mediano y largo plazo en el ambiente. Y bueno, todo esto para compartir de que este tipo de análisis no serían posibles por parte de organizaciones de sociedad civil o la comunidad en general si no pudiéramos acceder a la información que en este caso fue publicada en el observatorio. Con esto eh, dejaría mi intervención. Hasta acá. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, Julian. And with that said, I think uh, let's go ahead and move now to Lily. Um, Lily, please come in as soon as you're ready. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you've been listening. So I would have loved to um, also hear what Mr. Julian had to say, but essentially I picked bits and pieces from the, um, the screen as it went on. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the things that has come up as learnings for me, especially because we have had youth engagements and initiatives crop up around um, the impact of um, technology and the use of the digital systems currently on the environment, and essentially looking in the long term at climate change. I'm going to be running through some slides quickly, um, but I'm also going to um, read from my screen because it's so far. I wish I could zoom in to um, see it, but I'll just make this as interactive and very informative as possible. So I'm going to run through um, uh, sustainability and then environmental data and some of the learnings in some of our initiatives that were youth-based and are really global, especially because you had representation from all over the world. So my name is Lily Edina Mboche, and I coordinate also the Ghana Youth Internet Governance Forum, aside from working with the Hakla Foundation to advance IT for young people in Ghana, that is presenting them to um, matching their talents to jobs and also their skills also to jobs in the market. Um, we are going to run quickly through 
what digital sustainability has come of us um, uh, to us in our, in, our, in our work and also what, why we need environmental data and uh, just a, a bit on data governance and also data protection and human rights. So I, I saw this quote online somewhere and to me, as somebody who was starting off exploring sustainability and the impact of technologies on the environment, um, who initially had the thought of um, the sustainability through IT on one hand and also um, solving sustainability issues with IT. So it's like greening IT and greening through IT. So you are looking at essentially the impact that um, the usage of tools um, in ICTs and uh, in technology has an environment and how also you can tackle environmental issues with IT, especially because there is availability of data and what the data presents to us is very staggering and sometimes would cause you to want to look for the next action um, to, to, to take. So the quote said that humanity today is interconnected and dependent on both digital and natural worlds. As a result, Tackling climate crisis and the broader sustainability agenda and working toward a just equitable digital future are increasingly intertwined agendas. You would have people tell you how extensive of the offline world is now on the online world. And most of us might have already taken out, say, taken up, say, dual citizens because we are uh, first citizens of our countries and also play in the digital world. And um, maybe over the years we have explored so much how to maximize the use of technology and uh, have really looked at the importance this has on us. But the sadly, the ills or the disadvantages, which are most times not very um, obvious um, until there's data presented. And that is the complexity of the, of the, the issue when it comes to sustainability with, with the digital space and also looking at the impact of technology on the, digit, on, on the environment that we are in and essentially um, the, the, the climate in future. Um, sustainability in basic terms would be how you would, digital sustainability in basic terms would be how we can use technologies essentially to at, uh, attain SDGs and doing them in, will, in ways that are actually um, preserving the future for generations to come. And you'd, you'd see in subsequent slides some of the work we did with the German informatics in 2019 around digital sustainability where you'd had recommendations for what we envision for sustain, digital sustainability and what we envision for um, the environment as we try to connect the next billion. So um, in, in, in learning or coming to find out what the impact of technology has on the environment, um, one time in one of the sessions with uh, the, the Polish government, there was like more preparatory, um, preparatory sessions towards this. There was something that um, on a panel, uh, a panel member said that really struck me. He's, he mentioned that you would usually find sustainability um, in, three, in three facets. The first to be the economic viability, um, and then you go also to um, environmental protection and then social equity. He mentioned on that panel that over the years we have seen initiatives come up that have more, uh, more, than, more than often times sought to look at how um, technologies can be very beneficial to governments, organizations, to communities by maybe presenting uh, opportunities for employment, for partnerships and whatnot, especially to drive some economic activity. That, has been hap that is happening and so far getting some success. And then he mentioned also that the advocacy now is at the intersection of what we term as social equity and also environmental protection. You would have find out that in a quest to make um, some, some, some growth or improvement with technology when it comes to the economic part, we left the issues of social equity and environmental protection to not too much attention. And now because the data is available to tell us how dire the situation is, some effort is now currently rallied around these two areas. So when we talk about the social part, we'll be looking at the inclusion aspect um, when it comes to connecting people and also how sustainably, sustainably we are doing this. You, want to even, you even want to explore what alternatives there are to connecting people so that you don't have um, so much impact on the environment. And we can look at mining of um, resources that probably are, built, uh, are used to build hardware or probably even the effect of um, the consumption of electricity by data centers on the environment or even just you walking out of your room. Because, I mean, if you were in the session before this on the PNE um, um, recommendations, you'd have heard one of the panel members say that it's moved, we've moved from um, the very technical part of solving issues of 
data sustainability, to even mindset changes, to how you probably put off your, your light when you're leaving your, your homes, to everything that comes together to, um, in the long run, impact climate and an environment. So those areas are what over the years probably have had attention, but we want to come into the, the, the dispensation now where we are, and we're seeing the data that is presented, and it's, it's telling us how the environment is doing, and um, how if, there's, if we, we do not rally now conscious effort, we may probably, in the long run, not do ourselves um, any good when, we come to, when it comes to connecting the next billion. Um, we are going to look now at environmental data. My fonts are a bit uh, small, so I'll try to make uh, a, a small summary of what is written here. So environmental data would encapsulate various environmental parameters such as pollution levels, land use, change, water quality, soil quality, vegetation, public health, habitat fragmentation, and many others. In fact, when we began this session, Michael was kind to show us the different areas where um, there's impact when it comes to the technology environment nexus and how things are probably, I mean, um, in, 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 intersecting. So he mentioned the, the different areas to us, but when we talk about the data present, we are looking at the, the different areas um, of the environment and what is happening and how we're able to make insights and meaning into them. And it's Essentially, what's what's the the efforts are currently to be probably to to be to be able to tackle them, and these are not this is not an exhaustive list I, I've shared, but there are different things that comes up to play when we talk about the environmental data, and the PNE uh, recommendations. There's one part that essentially talks about how to even communicate, gather and communicate this data, and how to make it understandable by people who are even laypersons, and to make um, the, the fight towards sustainability with the digital, in the digital space very widespread and not left to only stakeholders or a select few. Um, so though environmental data remains one of the untapped areas, it can help optimize existing processes and catalyze meeting of some SDGs. And we all know very at the focal point or very pivotal in the SDGs are some things around sustainability of which um, the technology plays a big role. Now we're going to look at the how, how, where exactly the intersection is when it comes to technology and environment. And this year for my, for my research in school, because I'm doing a master's program, I, I, I just thought to look into essentially what companies are doing, what it is like um, with strategies across the world, but just very much narrow it down to best practices. And um, one of the books I was looking at was a book by Bill Tomlinson. It's called Green and True IT. And he lists, he, he, he lists out the complexities that exist when it comes to describing issues of the environment. And he takes us through time us through space and even lists the variables that exist that probably sometimes beat the understanding of um, our, our human minds and that is why we need data to be to be able to understand so there's the the broad range of time space and complexity around environmental concerns narrows the horizons of human understanding so if somebody was to talk about um, the the some projections for global climatic disruptions or things that are happening with melting ice caps it will be too far-fetched for you to envision. It will probably be very, very deep, and you may want to see how exactly it affects us. But what IT does for us is to bridge that gap between our understanding and the environmental skills, things that are happening, and to make us appreciate it better. And um, for everyone who knows about what, who knows about working with data, data will give you an insight into what, into what is happening the current state or even a projection so you're able to understand better. So um, environmental data is what, is, is this is what environmental data does to us and we are going to go on to look at the intersection uh, or moving from just the data that's available to its governance and um, the facet or attributes of the data that currently are, co are collected. So when we come to data governance, we would talk about how to manage, manage in its entirety the availability, the usability, and the integrity and security of data. Now we are focusing on maybe enterprises and like industries and everything, but we can bring this to country level. We can bring, down, bring it down to even the granularities to talk about even communities, right? So um, these, this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is what we can um, really gather from the whole governance part. And you would find out that effective data governance ensures that data is consistent and trustworthy and doesn't get misused. Yesterday, I was talking to somebody who works in um, 
the space around the technology and environment intersection, and she's from Southern Africa. I mentioned this panel was existing, and she, she, the first thing she said was, how do people gather data, and how do they um, essentially share it, or in fact, the last question she asked was, how do you monetize this data, especially for communities that are growing and probably have people that interface with them and have certain information that are helpful for um, decision making? Her, her point of view was around the gathering, how it is um, maybe worked on and how it is presented. She was giving examples of how communities would readily make information available, but nothing else comes out of it, and then um, it's, 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 we are stuck there, and probably no, no other action is taken, and then we're back to square one. I'm going to go on to talk about attributes of environment, environmental data and what is um, essential when it comes to gathering this data and making it work for us, essentially. Um, what I've written here is part of um, models for interventions, usually in industries, but I'm picking the parts that would really relate to environmental data. That is when we look at the pressures, the states, and the impact. Usually you find a D before all these. The D is for drivers. In, in industry, they want to explore some of these interventions to see um, which drivers are available and then move on to the pressures that are existing, that is to talk about um, things that are happening with whatever drivers we're looking at, and then the states and the impact. But for environmental um, data, we are going to look at the pressures, and I was explaining a bit what the attribute pressure means. And this holds attributes like pollution, population growth, extraction of resources, land use change. In essence, these are the ones that exert pressure on the environment, and ultimately have an impact. So what is it that can, um, in the long run, have an impact? And how is it presented? You want to look at it under the pressure um, attribute. And when it comes to the state, you want to see um, the active situation of the various natural resources, such, such as vegetation, biodiversity, water quality, air quality, habitat, and whatnot. And then the impact. The impact part is what now people are envisioning. But then the, the, work, that, the work that's currently happening with, say, the PNE is gathering the the, the research part, trying to present what the pressures and impact, what the pressures and states are currently, to make us appreciate what an impact essentially would be. So the impact to look at the impact of human activity on the environment, um, how it can better be understood, and then on the other aspects also. And I, I, I cite where I picked this from. I want to look at how the conversation is changing and, and, and evolving, and what's is changing currently, how the, the scene is evolving. And uh, usually you find that the uh, environmental IT systems already exist. That's uh, probably tackling the issue of non-sustainability and probably making things more sustainable. And you move from smart energy grids to systems that optimize hybrid car engines. And I cite also where I pick it from, but this is what is currently happening, but there is more to it. And there are some, some things that are happening currently that's even weren't set out to be, say, environmentally inclined or like very much focused on environmental impact, but they are doing it. And some of those are GPS systems and mapping systems. So if you were to get an optimal route to drive from point A to point B, because you've cut or reduced CO2 emissions, you're also invariably contributing to um, some impact on the environment. So this goes to show us that your inactions or actions uh, are essentially going to contribute to something um, towards sustainability, especially if you're using a, a, a um, digital means or even technology for your business, for yourself, for the communities that you work in. And uh, we are going to move. Lily, I'm sorry, I have to cut you off there. But yes. Everything you were saying was fantastic, and we are, I really appreciate it, but just in the interest of time, we do need to move on. I mean, Keep anything that you have mm -hmm. for a little bit later in case you want to come back to it. Right. And I just have to say personally, all the work that you do, the advocacy, it's, inc it's inspiring, frankly. So keep it up. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, for, uh, can we go ahead now and move to our next speaker um, before we come to uh, just a round of questions? Our next speaker is Dave. Dave, are you online? Great. I yes, see the mayor. you. Yeah, I, I hear you. Please, the floor is yours. <laughs> try to keep, uh, and I should have mentioned this in the beginning, apologies that I didn't. Try to keep your, your intervention to 10 minutes. Um, yep. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining. The floor is yours. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully it works. How's that? 
it, we see it just fine. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm here representing uh, the Network for the Digital Economy and Environment. Uh, our group is about five years old, and it uh, includes the Environmental Law Institute, which is an independent think tank in Washington, D.C., uh, Yale University School for the Environment, and people at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, we're funded by the Internet Society Foundation, and we're funded by the Sloan Foundation. And our main mission is to fund research. We think there has to be much more research. And also we have to build a research community around this whole issue of what are the impacts of the digital economy? So we focus on uh, artificial intelligence, on blockchain technologies, uh, the internet of things and sharing and e-commerce platforms. And we're also doing work on cross-cutting issues uh, like uh, indirect and rebound effects of, of digital interventions. So I'm gonna basically talk to you a little bit from the perspective of policymaker where I, sp I spent a lot of my time making in policymaking uh, environments and talk a little bit about how the research we've been doing um, can address some of the sort of common, I would say data or information dilemmas faced by policymakers. So here's the first one. <clears throat> I'm sure you're confused by this. I have been. Uh, just how much energy is Bitcoin using depends on the week, right? It could be as much as Denmark, Finland, Argentina. It'll be different next week. And there's seven to 8,000 cryptocurrencies out there. So one of the, and, and a lot of this data is coming from the New York Times. So it looks credible. So one of the first projects we kicked off about two years ago is we decided to do research on the research. So we were very interested in finding out where do these numbers come from? How are they produced? And basically whether they're valid or not. And so, uh, basically, what we found was there are massive variations in data and methods and the results. So we looked at both point estimates and also longitudinal studies. And you can see they're all over the place. Uh, the other thing I would make, make the point of is it's not just data. Uh, the data doesn't make much sense unless we run it through models. So here you can see the difference. There's three different ways of, of, of essentially estimating the, the, the energy use of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Some people use top-down economic models, there's bottom-up technology models, there's hybrids. The thing that's worrisome is you would hope after time that these lines would start to converge and they don't really. So, you know, what's going on here? I think it, it goes back to the point that was made at the beginning. There is no standardization, there's no harmonization across countries and there's no best practices whatsoever. Um, so we looked at, again, these studies and we tried to come up with some best practices. If you really wanted to do this in a way that it's empirically valid, that we could share, that we can make policy based on this. You need to things like sensitivity analysis. You need to look at parameter uncertainty. You need to run scenarios. You have to have accurate documentation. Some of these studies have no real documentation. The biggest flaw tends to be, whoops, uh, the system boundaries change. So I can produce almost every, any answer that you want regarding environmental impacts by changing the system boundaries. And so there's no real agreement about what's in and what's out. And if I change the system boundaries on this system, I could change the, essentially the answers you're asking me for. Uh, so this is an enormous opportunity. Again, it gets back to this the idea of no standardization, no harmonization, no agreement about data val val uh, validation, what models to use, how to share models, how to improve them over time. Basically, very little valid research, but enormous amounts of media hype. So here's another one, uh, no data. So this, you can see the kind of warring narratives around ride sharing, around Uber and Lyft. Uh, it, it hasn't worked, it could work. Why do we let it happen? I mean, the good news is, you know, in Europe, 100 cities have now committed to carbon neutrality by 2030. There's a lot of cities in the US, other countries, but they need data. So here's the greenhouse gas inventory from, from San Francisco. Uh, this is pretty useful for policymakers, but there's no ride sharing in there. You have no idea if you're trying to think about what do you do with the ride sharing, micro mobility systems. Uh, a lot of this has changed from the pandemic. Um, so this project decided to figure out, well, how much does ride ha hailing take up of this entire greenhouse gas emissions inventory? It's about 6%. It's not a lot, but it's not a trivial amount and also, basically developed a methodology that used data that's available, at least to cities in California, um, to figure out this particular portion of the greenhouse gas uh, emissions inventory for cities. The last one I will point to is, is you, you basically, you don't have enough data, you have partial data, you're not overwhelmed by data, 
but you don't see the whole system. Again, you have warring narratives about the validity and usefulness of artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a paper we uh, put together with some people on how to apply artificial intelligence to climate change mitigation. So the goal was to look at the entire system again, the compute related impacts, the intermediate uh, impacts from applications, and also the systems level impacts. I'll point to two that I think we're, we're missing that are usually most of the discussions. One of the things that's striking is it takes a lot of energy actually to train machine learning algorithms. So these are trained largely for speed and efficiency. If you're doing work on visual or image recognition, there's very little emphasis on how to make these energy efficient. So we, we spent some time talking to researchers about how you incentivize computer scientists and data scientists to think about the environment and sustainability when they're creating machine learning algorithms. Um, the other one that's interesting is what is the fossil fuel industry doing with AI? So there's a lot of talk about using AI in terms of predictive forecasting, methane control, but an awful lot of it is also being used to increase the extraction from existing well systems. So, you know, it, it, it's upstream, it looks at exploration, fuel, essentially fossil fuel extraction. So somehow when you start looking at the whole system, you have to put those things into the equation. So again, we're trying to think about what do you have in, what's out, how do you get research in there that allows people or policymakers to think about this. Um, this leads me to just a bunch of guidelines for policymakers as data consumers. Uh, the first one should be obvious, to question your system boundaries. Somebody comes, gives you numbers, ask them what's in and what's been left out, what methodologies. Trace the data back to its sources. One of the things that happens again and again is the data becomes disconnected from the research. So you have this data, these numbers that are just floating out there in the media sphere, and they get locked onto and reproduced, uh, and nobody actually goes back and checks them. Rely on independent peer-reviewed research. Most of the research we do goes eventually into peer-reviewed journals. We think that's very important. Dig into the footnotes. I mean, it's boring or have your staff do it, uh, but see what's in the footnotes, the caveats. Follow the money, right? Who is funding the research? Again, a lot of time, who's funding the research has been disconnected from the results. Ask some expert, experts. Um, these are, I think, just basic guidelines. Uh, if you happen to be people who are funding, we need order of magnitude increases, strategic increases in investments in independent research in this area. Uh, we're just scratching the surface. We need to focus much more on, on interdisciplinary research at the interface between physical and behavioral sciences. It's not just the technologies, the data centers, the networks, the mobile phones. It's what happens when we put those in the hands of human beings. So it's our digital lives that are gonna have massive impacts. We've gotten to the point in most developed countries where we've made human consumption frictionless, where anybody can buy anything any time of the day from anywhere. And we have to think about what the implications of that are and we need social scientists to help us do that. We need to leverage more funding between countries across agencies with philanthropies. We need a lot more money. I'll, I'll just share one more thing, sort of a prediction of the future. Um, I think you're gonna see a change in the narrative. If you go back five years, everything was wonderful. Digitalization was gonna save the world. Here's one Harvard Business Review. Uh, sharing economy is gonna give people the benefits of ownership without the, the impacts on the environment. Happy faces everywhere. Um, none of this was based on research. And I think what's happened now is the research is catching up with the rhetoric. So we just funded a major analysis, sort of we do state of the, state of the knowledge analyses. Uh, two researchers in, in Israel took a thousand uh, journal articles on the impacts of sharing platforms and boiled those down to about 67 that we thought were very good. They were peer reviewed, quantitative empirical studies. And take a look at this, right? Uh, on the mobility side, uh, most of these say that there's more negative than positive impacts. Housing, same thing. Goods sharing, sh food sharing, sharing garden output, sharing tools seems to be leaning positive, right? So this is a very different narrative than what we saw about or heard about for the sharing economy uh, a number of years ago. The interesting thing is this, I call it the zone of it depends. So what's gonna happen, I think, as we move forward is an awful lot of whether this is positive or negative, it's gonna depend on public policies, corporate behavior, individual behavior, it'll depend on subsidies, incentives, behavioral nudges. It's a huge, huge opportunity to go into this zone and begin to move more things from the red side to the green side. So that's it. Um, 
This is our network uh, website. We have a very extensive curated bibliography you can access. Uh, we have an inventory of blockchain uh, applications for the environment beyond Bitcoin. Uh, and we'd love to have you subscribe to uh, a newsletter that we put out uh, probably every few weeks now. Thank you. Thank you, David. Not only was that perfectly on time, that was such a wonderful contribution in addition to this discourse. So thank you very, very much for that. Now, before we move to our, our next segment, I just want to ask uh, everyone, anyone in the audience here or anyone online, if you have any questions for, for Dave, Lily, or Yulian. Okay, as I see no hands either in the Zoom room or uh, here in, uh, in Katowice, I will go ahead and move on to the next segment. And then we will come back again to Q&A and some, some more discussion between the, the panelists. Um, now we're gonna move to our second set of speakers. Uh, we have who are going to discuss the impact of environmental data governance on multi-stakeholder actors and policy making. Joining us now are Jeremy Rolison, the Senior Director of EU Government Affairs at Microsoft, and Goodness Ode, the representative from the Youth Nigeria IGF. So, Jeremy, over to you. And please, just as a reminder, please try to keep your comments to 10 minutes. Absolutely. And thank you. And I'm actually already have learned a lot from several of the interventions, so very happy to be here today. Um, I do have a few slides that I'm going to share, and I promise that I will stay on time. Here we go. Let me know if you can see this okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we see it. Okay. You got a bit of a sneak preview there. Um, listen, this is a topic that um, I think I'm very excited about because I spend most of my time in the data governance space. I manage a team here in Brussels that is responsible for a lot of our contact with policymakers and public policy in this space, particularly around the reuse and access to data. And when we think about this in a sustainability context, we're seeing more and more activity, not just for the decision making that can power some of the public policies that emerge from EU institutions and national governments, uh, but also the business decisions of our customers. So at Microsoft, we've made a number of announcements over the past few years demonstrating our commitment to this space. And, and that takes a number of forms. I think it's not limited to sustainability. But there certainly is a lot of opportunity there when we think about this in the context of cross-border challenges, societal challenges. These are not unique to just cities or countries, but these are very much global challenges when we're talking about climate change and uh, the impact of human activity in that space. So learnings from one space can really be extrapolated to the other. And I think when we talk about multi-stakeholderism, that point becomes clearer than ever. So with as much focus as policymakers in Europe and around the world, many of our customers have taken when it comes to artificial intelligence and developing machine learning, I think it goes without saying, and many people here are aware that, listen, artificial intelligence requires vast sums of data. It also requires significant computing power. Many of the opportunities that we're talking about are really you know, there because of what technology can do when you have access to the right type of data and you put the right questions to that data. It can't be done though without talent as well. So it needs to have the set of researchers and the skills that are asking the right questions. So it requires an ecosystem of players really, those providing the technologies, those asking the questions, those with the goals, for all of this to come together and really start to extract and put value into some of the insights that can be grabbed. So at Microsoft, we've recognized this because we've seen the way that customers around the world in different sectors are increasingly innovating on top of the data they already have or data that they're getting access to. That can take the form of proprietary data, public data, uh, data exchanges. And more and more, we're providing building blocks for that space. And I, I want to drill down on one of the main messages here that, you know, the value in this data is not really in the data itself, but it's what we learn from that data. And again, we can only learn from it if we're using the right tools, we're asking the right questions, and we're really talking to the right people. 
data governance in this space uh, has already been addressed to uh, an extent. And I, and I think, again, particularly when we're talking about anything implicating personal data or proprietary data, trade secret data, I like the way uh, the speaker uh, mentioned earlier, you know, people have questions, well, how do I do this? Well, we can answer that question in many ways with technologies. But then you say, well, how can I do this in a secure fashion? How can I do this in a way that protects my IP? How can I do this in a way that uh, remains compliant with different privacy laws or uh, other data governance principles that do vary sometimes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. You know, the good news is that I think there's a lot of policy attention on that space. We're seeing more urgency there um, to really take advantage of the value that data can bring if we're if we're extracting those insights. Uh, and the good news is that different technologies are emerging that can mitigate some of those reservations or risks that come up in this context. Which is why it was a couple of years ago that, you know, recognizing also the danger of an emerging data divide around the globe where certain companies or certain countries have such a head start potentially in emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning, that there's a risk that too much of the benefits then would be concentrated in the hands of those same players. One way around that or one way of addressing it is, is really to focus on a more open approach. Data sharing and data reuse can go a long way towards hopefully closing aspects of that divide. And it was two years ago that Microsoft launched our open data campaign. Um, it's not open data in the sense of just public sector data. I think where I sit in Europe, I think of open data much more in the context of public sector data. But we're talking about just organizations and individuals around the world being more open with their data to drive some of those positive outcomes and benefits that can come through enhanced data collaboration. So what we've done there is committed to adopting principles as we enter into that space. Many of those have actually been mentioned in some of the chat windows. It's been notions of security, reusability, privacy, trust. Um, and also the formatting that we take place, that we use in this space, making sure it's usable um, and also making it easier from our side uh, to put forward technology that is in the hands of those companies and those policymakers and those researchers that can use such tools to, again, get that value from the insights that come in the data itself. We've committed to standing up 20 of these data collaborations to lead by example by 2022. And, and I'm happy to say that, you know, many of them have taken place in a sustainability context. So when we think of some of the ways that this becomes more concrete, you know, it's been projects that we've been involved in either as a technology partner, providing some of the infrastructure that can go into that space and the compute power that can be used by others to run these machine learning algorithms on that type of data or to put in their own data to analyze that further or whether we're contributing data ourselves. Uh, all of this is done in those principles that I mentioned earlier, but several of it, it takes concrete form in the shape of what we were doing in the London Air Quality Project. This was leveraging, you know, a mix of different sensor data to determine more, you know, patterns in air pollution. Uh, interestingly, one of the takeaways from the campaign, too, is a project that was aimed at addressing environmental needs at a city level and really collecting different types of data in different formats, compiling that in a way that you could take aggregate conclusions from. We learned that the data that we were collecting, this was happening kind of before the pandemic hit. That data could also then be repurposed for tracking some of the effectiveness of COVID measures at a city level. Again, not implicating personal data in any way, but looking at public data sets and patterns that could emerge from that, that we were looking at for environmental purposes, could also then be used to, to monitor traffic patterns and the like that took on a little bit more relevance during the pandemic. We've also teamed up uh, with the Linux Foundation and Alliance and AWS and others uh, around a uh, OS climate uh, project to inform investments decision making based on sustainability criteria an open data commons and an open source way of looking at this to make sure the businesses around the world, investors and the like, that community has access to sustainability data that can make more informed investment decisions. Again, we can contribute that 
we can contribute to that through technology. We can contribute to that with some of the data that we have available. Um, but it really requires people with a knowledge of maybe one sector or a need to understand the right questions to ask and the right uses that could come out. Then you can start to identify the right parts of the ecosystem, whether it's technology players that need to be approached, whether it's data scientists, or whether it's in investment players in this instance. Um, I think those have been some of the learnings from our campaign. And the good news is you don't need to collect new data for this. Much of this data already exists. But there really are mountains and mountains of data. And one of the examples that I think shows, again, where we're trying to lead by example and make this data available for others to use along with those tools was the launch of the Microsoft's planetary computer. Um, I would encourage folks here to look at this if you haven't seen it already. This is something where you know Microsoft made a in the context of our biodiversity initiative and commitments that we've made in an AI for Earth uh, initiative more broadly, um, where we put together a data catalog and a hub. And this is a partnership with other players uh, compiling vast amounts of environmental data that can be used by players in different industrial sectors, at the policy making level, even individuals. Uh, to understand things ranging from flood patterns to real-time analysis of climate change impacts, uh, weather patterns, traffic and population density, tree density, land cover. Um, there's a wide variety there that's only possible because of the cloud compute power behind that. So the data may rest one place. It can only be processed or visualized in a way to get the right type of conclusions if you're bringing in the right type of techno technology tools. And again, we need to know where to find this data. We need to know how to format this data. So it requires working with partners. And, I, and again, I think it comes back to the multi-stakeholder approach that we want to take across this space more broadly. These are great examples of where when people are working together, we can drive some of those insights that can be reused uh, for others looking at similar problems in more local jurisdictions. So again, I think that the key takeaways for us in this space, and particularly when we're talking about a challenge that crosses borders, it's not limited to just one community or another, but you do have environmental goals and objectives at a community level, at a country level, at a regional level, at a global level. You know, all of this data uh, is going to be better if it's more accessible and people have access to the right tools to be able to run that analysis over top. So the takeaways that we wanted to just call out is we need to do everything we can to continue to make data sharing easier, uh, making data available for reuse in secure and trusted formats, uh, really across borders. You know, the way that people are looking at this on one side of the globe can really inform the decision making that's taking place on another side of the globe, particularly in the context of climate change. You know, this is not limited to just one country or another. Uh, this requires working together in that space. So it's a really good example of where multi-stakeholderism can be incredibly effective. You know, we often say, you know, we can't address a problem that we don't understand and we can't address a problem that we can't measure. Uh, data is vital to that part of the problem analysis. So if we can't fully understand it, it's hard for you know, anyone else to fully understand it. We can't solve those type of problems unless, again, we're coming together and we're putting data and digital technology to work best. We're committed to continuing to share um, the data that we've been able to compile thus far and make available in an open format for others to reuse. We're going to continue to make those type of commitments to research and shareable and reusable data that can help benefit the decisions our customers are making, but not just our customers. This is publicly available material, and we'd encourage everyone here to take a look at it because, again, there's a cross-border relevance that I think uh, can't be understated or overstated. Pardon. And again, the final point is really coming back to you know, what we're here to talk about today. Uh, this only works if we all join forces, getting the right policies together. And I'm engaged on that at the European level, and we're seeing a lot of even urgency uh, post-pandemic, particularly for Build Back Better initiatives to make sure that you know, these are as green as possible. Well, this can only be solved if we have the right data available for those type of decisions that industries across Europe are going to increasingly be making as they meet new emissions objectives or efficiency objectives. Um, but you need to have access to the right tools at the same time. You need to have the access to the data. You need to have the access to the right tools, the right skills, the right talent. Um, this is really a societal challenge, and I think it's one that requires different stakeholders to join forces. This is not something that 
Microsoft has enough tools at its disposal to solve. It's only when we're working together uh, in those type of data collaborations in this particular instance that we can start to see some real progress. We're excited about the progress that has been made already. Uh, we're excited at the direction this is taking. I think there's an increasing recognition, not just of the importance of data, but the importance of bringing the right tools and the right talent to those type of questions. And I think sustainability and environmental data is one that perhaps even has more optimism than others, um, where it's a common challenge that we all have, and it's one that is timely, uh, particularly as we emerge uh, from the pandemic, and one that you know really highlights the need to work on these type of questions uh, on a global level, um, and certainly across borders. So I will stop there in the interest of time and look forward to hopefully answering any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jeremy. And just a very quick, uh, a very quick addition is that uh, Rainer Krug also made a very good point, and that is not only national but also the local level is really important. As Julian um, also in his intervention made it, you know, kind of exa uh, explained very clearly. So uh, first, before we move on to goodness, our, our final speaker, I just want to just check with our colleagues in the back, uh, our technical colleagues, just to see if. Maybe just a thumb up or thumb down, if we could have just a, a couple extra minutes in this session, given the disruption, um, just so I know how to, to time it. Thank you very, very much. So with that, uh, goodness, are you available? Are you ready? Please, uh, go ahead and come on camera, unmute yourself, and you have 10 minutes. Or feel free to leave your camera off for bandwidth issues, if you prefer. If you're speaking, we can't hear you, and you're not unmuted. I'm just going to try writing. Here we go. Hi, goodness. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. And, and, we, and we hear your, uh, your son or daughter as well. But that's perfectly fine. Thank you for joining. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot put on my video at the moment. No worries. Please go ahead fine? with your intervention. Yes. All right. Thank you for having me. Good day, everyone. I would appreciate if um, the moderator can help share my slide. I've shared that with Juliana a while ago. Yes, we can see them. All right. So once we sharing it, I'm just going to um, start with a story. So. Um, I was in Nairobi, Kenya, um, some days ago, and I'm from Nigeria in Africa. I traveled to Nairobi for a workshop, still related to the work I do, and I got to go around the city, and I went to a mall to get some things, chocolate, milk, and a few other things. So after buying these things, I went to the pain point, the cashier I paid, and the... Like, they gave me the stuff I bought in my hands, and I was like, there's no bag. They said, no bags. I was surprised, but pleasantly surprised, because um, I got to understand that in Kenya, three years ago, due to the high level of environmental pollution, and we all know the effects, the government banned the use of plastic bags, and um, there is no use of plastic bags in Kenya, and if you have to use a bag, it has to be a reusable bag, which you have to pay for. So the fact that you have to even pay for the bag would make you prioritize if you need the bag or not. And interestingly, I didn't need a bag for what I bought. I just held it in my hands and went back to my hotel. So the feelings that came to me with that realization is I so long for when Nigeria would get here. When would Nigeria be able to achieve this feat? And I could see how beautiful, green, and environmentally, um, in, a, in a way, conserved the, the Nairobi climate is. Um, I, I was able to read up a lot about what progress has been made since um, the, the three years the band was made and where they are now. And I learned that they were able to emulate Rwanda 
in that in that approach. And for me as a Nigerian and all my environmental advocacy, I just look forward to when our government will do that. And that's where the importance of data comes in. I'm still waiting for my slide to come come up. So yeah, Good. that's my story. And yes, I'm going to be preaching. I've actually shared this with my Nigerian audience and a, a lot of my contacts are really happy that um, a country in Africa is making such progress. We look forward to other countries replicating that action and to make a lot of difference. Yeah, um, apologies is anybody about the lack of slides. Share my slide or not? Or if I could just like run. No, we're, no. We unfortunately we don't have access to your slides. Goodness, apologies for that. But I think if you can just go ahead and, All right, that's uh, and fine. continue. Let me just go ahead. So, um, when 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 I was reached out to by my friend Florina, she she told me she saw the work I'm doing with Nigerian Youth SDGs Network. Nigerian Youth SDGs Network is a network of young people who are organizing to localize the sustainable development goal. And what is beautiful about our approach is that. It is young people who are leading this advocacy. It is young people who are pushing for sustainable development, engaging the government through civic participation. Um, and in general, I would say that the organizing approach, because we have over 250 um, civil society organizations in our network, has yielded a lot of results. And um, one thing that it's unique with what we do and young people leading these changes, it brings a lot of hope to say that Young people are not just um, this group of people who are um, problematic because in the Nigerian context, the government see young people as um, they have a lot of issues that are difficult to deal with, but young people are actually the solutions we need to the problem. And we've seen it in our organizing. So most recently, um, um, the programs and project lead, and um, in the last COP26 that was hosted in Glasgow, we also got young people to young people who are climate action champions um, to share. We reached out to a few of those champions in Nigeria, and we had over, over 10 of them who shared their expectation and enthusiasm towards COP26 and in the context of Nigeria. And with, with the amazing things this, um, this COP, um, climate action champions shared with us, I think what is key for us is that we, we understand that the, the, the environment has changed, climate is, is, the effect is real, we can see it, but there's a lot of hopefulness from young people and from young people organizing. So, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, no worries, and it's perfectly fine. Let me know if you can hear me. All right, great. So I would say that um, this shows that for sustainable development to be vested, then we need to have an inclusive approach to, the, to, to, to achieving it. And um, the, the theme of this year, IGF, is more than important because um, for any, any intervention to take place, for any government or stakeholders to listen to you and consider your advocacy to be a real issue, you have to present the data, you have to present the facts. And at present, for us in Nigerian Education Network and the Nigerian population, we can all see the effects in of, of the changing climate. We can all see that there's rising sea levels, there's drought in, in the northern region, and where we're supposed to have like rainy season, it's dry. And at the moment, it's supposed to be dry season, but in some regions in Nigeria, it's still all rainy, and it's like, like fluctuating and affecting agriculture and every process of life. But this data is important. Generating and gathering this data is important. But the concern we have with data is um, the authenticity of the data. And in, in, in some cases, to trust this data. But I think taking a first step in the right direction is gathering this data. And as much as there are existing data at the global level, we have insufficient data at the national level. And um, this is a concern. So um, <laughs> when, um, um, for us in Nigeria, our president attended COP26 and he, he, the, the commitment we got from him wasn't so great. We were not so excited with with the commitment that we um, was gotten. And young people are still pushing and advocating. And I feel that it's, it's important that this continues. But even with our vocal advocacy and engaging stakeholders, I feel that there is a need of prioritizing um, the use of data, gathering original data. And um, we, could, we could begin in the right, we could begin from the effects we are seeing in our environment. We could begin with 
with people, everybody has affected, affected no doubt, but critical stakeholders still have been affected by this. So these are like important pieces to be doing. Thank you. Goodness. Did, did we lose you? Yeah, so that will be all for me, um, for me from my end. I don't know if you have any question. But just before I, I, I leave, I know that Serena also mentioned about the SDG playbook which we created. And um, the SDG playbook is a tool that um, for us at Nigeria, as you said, came together and we developed over 200 ways to achieve sustainable development. And if you look specifically at SDG 11, which is looking at sustainable environment, um, this playbook is critical to look at um, ways in our daily lifestyle that we can achieve a more sustainable community, a more sustainable environment, as little as um, avoiding the use of plastic bags, reusable bags, avoiding environmental pollution, switching to green technology. Those little ways are just very important things and steps that we can take. And I'll be happy to share the link for anybody who's interested to take a look at the SDG playbook. It's all encompassing, but the beautiful thing is it has a rule everybody has to play. And unfortunately, I couldn't share my slide, but I think everything I've shared encompasses everything. I'll be happy to, to respond to questions and any other clarification needed. Thank you. Thank you, goodness. We really appreciate that. And we certainly understand that you can't just put your life on hold uh, to dial in. So thank you so much for your intervention and for sharing that story, especially of what's happening in Nigeria. Um, with that said, can, we, can just, because we are running out of time, I do appreciate that we're, we've been allocated a little bit extra just uh, because of that. Thank you all so much to our Polish team. Um, can we just have all of the speakers come back onto the screen just to, to have a little bit of, just maybe to encourage some dialogue and um, get some questions from the audience as well. If there, I saw one in the chat, for instance. Um, I guess just, the very first question I have before I open it up to the audience is, do any of the speakers have anything that they would like to respond to each other? Anything in particular that was said that was particularly um, you know, controversial or that you disagree with, et cetera? If not, then I will open the floor for questions. Just does anybody have, uh, we gotta go? No worries, okay, I'm so sorry everyone that we couldn't take these questions, but uh, uh, given everything. But just very quickly, I just wanna say thank you to everyone, thank you to the speakers, to the audience. Uh, I wanna thank, of course, Juliana and Joyce and Teresa for uh, the facilitators of the session to, um, to the Secretariat and the entire team here in Poland uh, helping to make this um, happen, including our translators. Thank you very much. And then last but not least, our, our transcriber, Becky, you have been incredible. Thank you so, so much for all the work that you're doing, which is behind me, actually. No worries. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.